Welcome. Hello. Hi, everyone. This is Alyssa Austin from Travel and Service Programs. I'm the director here. And my name is Becky McCluskey, and I am the assistant director with TSP. Great, and we are gonna go ahead and get started with our presentation tonight. Um, so just to um, orient you to your screen, um, so you should be able to see our slideshow right now, and then over on the right-hand side of your screen, um, you should be able to see like a little chat box. That's where you're going to enter any questions that you have at the end of the call. And um, we expect to have quite a few people on the presentation tonight, so we just really appreciate it if you um, can all mute your microphones just so we're not getting a lot of feedback. That would be helpful. And then, um, so as you are all aware, tonight we're talking about ICEP Vietnam 1 and 2, um, ICEP Japan, and ICEP China. And the presentation should probably take somewhere around an hour and 15 minutes, and we're um, going to leave some time at the end for you to have any questions. We do appreciate if you do hold any of your questions until the end, just because we have a lot of information to cover tonight, um, and we'll likely answer your question um, throughout the presentation. So just in terms of our agenda, um, the first uh, third of the presentation is really going to be about TSP in general, things that apply to all of these programs, um, and that includes orienting you to your online account, um, talking about family preparation and some of the more uh, major program components. In the middle, we're going to get into trip-specific slideshows, and these are relatively quick, but we're going to dig into some of the details of your programs um, so you can just learn more of those specifics. And then we'll wrap up the final third of the presentation with what we call the nuts and bolts. Um, this is the really like practical information such as um, packing and how transportation and healthcare work on the program and things like that. We've asked you for a lot of paperwork leading up to the summer, so we're just going to take a second to pull up an example account to point out some key pieces of it. So first, on the left-hand side, it will show you your account balance, and um, hopefully by this point, tuition balances were supposed to be paid in full by April 1st, um, but you might still have a balance if you set up a separate payment plan. Um, and if you'd like to make a payment yourself online, you can do that by just clicking on the Make a Payment button. Great. Um, it's really helpful for us if you click on the first two names listed at the top of the account because those are typically the primary and secondary contacts. And when you click on those names, it will pull up information about you. Um, and if you just double check that the email address you have listed there is correct, that's really helpful for us because that's how we'll be in touch with you primarily leading up to the summer. Then if you scroll down, there is the incomplete task slash forms list. And this lets you know all of the different items that we still need to receive from you and when they are due. Um, especially important on this list, if you scroll down towards the bottom, there's some online forms, including the camper wellness form. If you haven't completed this yet, please make sure you take the time to fill it out. Um, because we need to know any allergies or dietary restrictions in particular that your child might have. Once we receive the forms or the items on this list, sometimes it takes a day or two for us to process the paperwork on our end, but then the item should disappear from that list. So if you've submitted something and it's showing up two weeks later, please give us a call so that we can chat about it. And then last but not least, towards the top, if you go to the additional options tab, you can get to the document center by clicking right there, and that's where you go to upload your physical information. If you ever have any questions about paperwork for us or just how to use different aspects of your online account, please just give us a call or shoot us an email. We're happy to help you out with that. In addition to your paperwork, there's a lot of other details we ask you to stay on top of as well. So the first being your passport. Uh, if you don't have one, you need to apply for one ASAP, and at this point you should be um, getting it expedited if you don't have one. Um, we encourage everyone just to double check on your passport to make sure that it's valid for six months beyond your return to the U.S. We've been checking everyone's passport copies and passports as they've been coming into us, uh, but it's helpful if you just double check that on your end as well. 
For the ISEP China program, we need to have your actual passport here with us so that we can apply for your visa. But for everyone else, we just need a photocopy of it ahead of time. And so um, if you are on one of the other programs, you are welcome to mail us your, your passport ahead of time, but uh, you don't need to. Please just make sure you definitely remember to bring it with you to check-in day here at camp. In addition to that, make sure you're checking your online account. You can get paperwork and different items into us early if you're so inspired. Uh, one of the items on your task list is to send us an updated copy of your physical. And it's currently due on May 1st, but we completely understand if families have physicals that are scheduled after that May 1st due date. If that's the case, please just let us know and we can update your online account and make a note of it uh, so that you don't get annoying emails from us asking where it is. In addition to seeing your regular physician, we encourage everyone to also go to a travel clinic and meet with a doctor there because they can give you um, recommendations on vaccinations for traveling and just general information on how to stay healthy. Before you go to a travel clinic, we highly encourage you to first print off and read through the health memo that Alyssa emailed out a couple weeks ago. Um, that's important because it lists where you will be traveling while you're on your program, and that's information that the doctor at the clinic will need to know. In addition to that, we encourage everybody to visit the Center for Disease Control website or the CDC website. Um, when you visit their website, you can just type in the, the destination that you'll be traveling to, and it will give you a clear list of recommended vaccinations and, again, other health information for traveling. In addition to researching that, we encourage you to also take some time to learn more about the country you'll be visiting. So learn more about the history. You can visit the TSP website. We have a link for, called Family Resources where you can read more about um, some of the service projects you might do or organizations we partner with on the programs. And um, also, if you know anyone who has been on the trip or visited that country in the past, you should definitely reach out to them to learn from those people as well. Last but not least, leading up to the summer, we're going to continue to be in touch with families via email. So we'll reach out to you with your flight information, an updated program itinerary, and then certainly reminders about check-in day via email. And then your trip leaders will also give you a call in June just to say hello and to see if you have any last minute questions before the summer begins. Great, so um, all of our programs have three core components, including leadership development, service learning, and cultural exchange. And we're just gonna touch on each of those briefly, starting with leadership development. So I believe as all of you are aware, TSP is considered to be a first year leadership program. And what that means is that a big intention that we have is to help participants transition from the role of camper um, into the role of um, leader, whether that means you eventually make your way up to being staff at camp or really just take those leadership skills out into your community and other things that you're involved with. So we do have a curriculum that we use here, uh, which is based on something called behavior interaction styles. You don't have to know anything about that coming into the program because you'll learn all about it during your orientation. Um, but really, it's grounded in the idea that we feel like every um, person does have uh, unique leadership skills and we want um, participants on these programs to really be start starting the process of, of exploring what those are and learning what their strengths and weaknesses are. So throughout the program, you will meet with your trip leaders three times formally, um, just to discuss your goals for the program and talk about your progress. And then um, you will track all of that in something that we call CCR. Um, this is not intended to be an evaluation of you. It's really a document that is for you, for your own use, just to track your development and help you reflect and process throughout the program. Um, and then we always get questions just like specifically on the program, what types of leader act leadership activities are you going to be doing? Um, and an answer to that 
we have a program called Leader of the Day. So on each day of your program, there will be one to two participants who are charged with being the LOD. And that means that they work in tandem with the trip leaders, um, of course, their guidance, um, to take on leadership activities um, for the group. So that means that you might wake the group up. You could organize a meal for the group. You could be talking to our host partner to figure out what type of service projects you're doing that day and how to best get the group um, going. You could lead a cabin chat. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities and your trip leaders will talk to you a lot more about that once you arrive at camp. Your group will do some tourist activities on the program, but we try as much as possible to help you learn about the local culture in authentic ways. So as I mentioned before, uh, before the summer starts, we really encourage you to take some time to learn about the history, the government, holidays, major historical events, and so on that are connected to the country you'll be traveling to. Uh, because then on the program itself, you might get the chance to visit government buildings or museums and um, knowing the history certainly helps you to better understand the culture. Some of the other ways you'll get to learn about the culture include uh, potentially spending time with a host family or going on a home visit, um, and also getting involved in different community-sponsored programs and service projects, and also different types of classes like cooking classes and other activities through the Y. Um, so YMCA's overseas especially are, they're much larger than what we're typically used to here in the U.S. where they often have gyms and workout spaces, but they also have schools and computer labs and are sometimes cafes. And they really are just large community centers where people from the community come together. So um, in partnering with the Ys, it's a great way to learn more about local people. Great. So on TSP, we do service not just to serve the communities we visit, but really to connect and learn about the places and cultures that you're going to be spending time in. And with that, we encourage you to enter your service projects, not just with the mindset to help, even though that is important, um, but more to learn and show compassion. Um, the, the ideal is that we are working with communities to empower the people that live there and really to help develop relationships um, between you and them. So on each of your programs, we can expect between 40 and 50 hours of service work that's completed. And we try our best to have a pretty good mix of physical and social service. And that balance really depends on the place that you go. And so we'll talk a bit more in detail about the types of projects you can expect in just a little bit. Um, but then at the end of the program, we do write up all the hours of service that you complete because we know a lot of you have requirements through your schools for volunteer hours. So we have a service letter we'll send out. And if you have any additional paperwork that you need to be filled out, feel free to just be in touch with that. We purposely partner with YMCAs that have strong youth and teen programming. So there will be lots of opportunities for you to work with teens in a variety of ways on your program, including homestays, service projects, um, camp experiences, and also time at the Y. And so on these programs, we really view them as an opportunity to have an exchange with peers from another country. So we encourage you to push yourself um, to step outside of your ICEP group at times to meet those local teenagers. And um, we also really encourage you to try to learn even just a little bit of the local language, even if it's very different, learning just a few key words or phrases uh, really just shows people that you're interested in learning more about them and that you want um, to, to hear from them. So the majority of our programs do have some form of homestay on them. However, um, tonight's presentation is a little more unusual on that front, as out of all these programs, Japan is the only program that has a true homestay. Um, both Vietnam and China have homestay-like experiences, which we will talk a lot more about once we get into those um, specific slideshows. And um, But for our homestays, what you can expect is between five and 12 nights long. Um, for ISEP Japan, they're between uh, four and five nights long, actually, so they're a bit on the shorter end. And um, typically, the way they're set up is that you will be spending time with your family at night, but then during the day time you will meet back up with your um, home with your group to continue on your itinerary. 
Um, we do encourage participants from all of these programs to bring some kind of homestay gift. So um, for ICEP Japan, it is great to bring um, something small, keeping in mind that Japanese homes are pretty tiny, so big household items are not always appreciated. Um, but something small or something edible is great. So if you have like a favorite snack or, you know, a box of chocolates or something like that, uh, maple syrup, that's a great idea. Um, otherwise, like a small game can be a fun thing. Um, and then for the other two programs, Vietnam and China, you'll um, likely be meeting up with um, teenagers, either doing school visits um, or meeting up with a family during the daytime. So what I would suggest is to bring a few smaller gifts. Um, so that could be things like small little keychains. They don't have to be expensive. It's more just the gesture that counts um, or something of a similar size. And in addition, I think it's great to also bring things like um, postcards or a little stationary set that you could write like a nice card at the end of your experience. And then overall, I find that um, the homestay experience is something that a lot of participants feel nervous leading up to, which is totally normal because it's not every day that you spend the night with a family that you've never met before. Um, but leaving the experience, this is definitely um, one of the highlights that our participants have, just being able to interact with um, a family that lives in that country really gives you a very true um, cultural exchange opportunity. So um, anxiety is fine about it. Talk to your trip leaders, but know that it's, it's typically a very positive experience. It's our host partners who are in country who help to find and vet the host families for us. And so when it comes to finding host families, they reach out first to families who are already connected to the YMCA or who are in their immediate community or who are known by them personally. Um, and so a way of thinking about this would be if we knew we had a group of campers coming to the US from China and they wanted a homestay experience, we would reach out to families like you to see if you'd be interested in hosting them. And so um, whenever our host partner reaches out to prospective host families, they always make sure to review our expectations with those families. Um, some of those expectations include that participants are not allowed to have alcohol or smoke in the home, that a parent needs to be home while our campers are there, and that our campers can only ride in cars with licensed drivers who are 21 years old or older. While you're on the program itself, before your homestay begins, your trip leaders will sit down with the whole group and um, you'll just do a, a brief introduction to the homestay. So first you'll start by talking about the rules that we expect all of you to follow while you're in your homestays. Um, then we'll also talk about your ID cards. So when you arrive here at camp, we will have ID cards for everybody. And um, it's your responsibility to keep that ID card on you at all times during the program. And that's because the card will have contact information for us here at camp and also for an in-country cell phone that your trip leaders will be carrying with them throughout the whole program and contact information for our partners at the local YMCA. Um, and last but not least, certainly your trip leaders will talk to everybody about different tips and tricks that you can do to help make it a smooth transition into the homestay experience. So before the homestay begins, often there's some type of um, get together where your trip leaders will get to meet your host families or your host siblings. And then the first night of your homestay, the trip leaders will call each homestay to check in with you and to speak with you on the phone and just find out how things are going. Often um, trip leaders will create some type of code word where they know that if you say this silly word, often it's something like starfish, um, something you wouldn't normally say. If you say the code word, it means, hey, something's not quite right. I want you to come out here and check on me. And the trip leaders will do just that. They'll go out to your homestay and see how things are going. But like Alyssa said, really, these are amazing opportunities to uh, just learn more about a local family and see what day to day life is like. So it's really helpful to bring photos from home if you can get some printed before your trip. That's a nice way to easily break the ice um, or dif different card games or other simple games or help your family make dinner. Really, the more you put into the experience, the more you will get out of it. 
On TSP, you'll travel with a small group, uh, which is similar to what you've experienced at ca camp with your cabin groups. And we really feel that this is one of the most valuable parts of the program, just learning how to work together as a team to resolve conflict and really starting to understand what your unique contribution is to a group. So your leaders will place a strong emphasis throughout the program on this, um, starting right from the beginning with your orientation. And they really do expect you to play an active role in this as well. Um, Becky and I find that year to year, our itineraries remain pretty similar. Um, but what has a lot of effect on the program is how well en participants engage in the group dynamic and helping to support each other. So just something to be mindful about when you're going about coming into this. We have responsibilities we ask parents to take on to help us prepare both you and your child for their program. So we'll just review those right now. The first, as I've mentioned earlier, is just helping to make sure that you're getting paperwork in in a timely manner. The second is that you're taking the time um, to read through the various trip materials that we've sent out, especially the parent guide. Um, and so if you're not sure how to access the parent guide, please just send us an email and we'd be happy to send that off to you. Please let us know about any medical or behavioral needs your child has, and then also how you manage those at home, because we'll take that information and we'll pass it along to their trip leaders to try to help make it a smooth summer for your son or daughter. All of our programs are amazing opportunities for young people to meet other young people, to gain new perspective and to build their confidence. And so for parents, we just encourage you to uh, please give your child the space that is needed for them to get fully immersed in the program. Um, leading up to and during the summer, we are always here to help out with anything. So if you have any questions or concerns, please be in touch with us because we're happy to speak with you about anything that you have on your mind. And during the summer, while your child's on their program, it's fine for you to go on vacation, but you need to know that we must be able to reach you by phone or email throughout the entire program. Great, and just as parents have responsibilities, so too, of course, do participants, which we've already alluded to a bit. Uh, so the first is just that you're actively engaging in the program. That's, you know, we're going to have a ton of new activities for you to do. You're going to be in a new place and really paying attention that you are opting into the, the opportunities and really taking advantage of the place that you are. Um, next, looking out for each other, um, checking in with each other. And if you feel that somebody's off, making sure that you communicate uh, with the trip leaders about that. And just as you're looking out for your group members, you're also taking care of yourself. So you, we know that you all are teenagers um, and that you do have this ability to take care of yourself at home. However, traveling in a foreign country it can be a very different environment. And it's really important that you're looking out for yourself, um, staying hydrated, wearing sunscreen. And of course, again, communicating uh, whatever needs you have to your trip leaders, because they're definitely there to support you. Um, that's their main role throughout the program, but they just need to know what's going on. Um, personal responsibility over your belongings and your behavior, of course. Um, you are going to be responsible on this program for carrying your own belongings, which includes your passport, um, your wallet, any money that you bring with you, any items such as a camera or things like that. So if you do not feel like you're good at keeping track of things now, it's definitely an important thing to start practicing so that you feel comfortable once you get on your program. Expanding your comfort zone, um, we want you to be pushing your limits a little bit on this, um, not too much, of course, to the place where you don't feel safe. Um, but we want you to be reaching out to people on the program, developing relationships with people within your group, but also outside your group. Um, so really stepping out so that you can grow on these programs. And of course, last but not least, being a positive representative of Becca Chimney Corners as well as the U.S. Alrighty, so now we're going to jump into our program specific slideshows and we're going to start off with ICEP Japan. So for this program, the group is going to fly in and out of Tokyo and then um, you are going to be staying at the Tochigi YMCA, which is our main host. And it's about two hours outside of the city and outside of Tokyo in a small city called Utsunomiya. 
And um, from there, you will do some excursions outside of Utsunomiya um, to Nikko and also back to Tokyo, but the majority of the program will take place in Utsunomiya. So this is a picture of the outside of the Tochigi YMCA, which is going to be the home base for the program. And so we're actually still deciding where the group is going to be housed. It's possible that you'll be housed at the YMCA, um, or last year the group stayed at um, two of YMCA apartments um, that were rented for them for the summer. Um, but either way, the accommodations are very similar. Um, we have uh, kind of like dorm style housing, except you'll be sleeping on tatami mats because this is Japan. Um, and there is a small kitchen that is set up uh, for participants to help prepare your own breakfasts and things like that. One nice thing is that the Tochigi YMCA is pretty uh, centrally located in terms of transportation, so the group will often take the bus into town um, to go get dinner or just see other sites in Utsunomiya. Another um, perk of the YMCA is that it is attached to a kindergarten. And so our participants have um, a lot of involvement with the kindergarten. They'll go there several times throughout the program um, to sit in in classes and play with the kids. So it's a great idea to come prepared with just some simple games and songs that you could teach to them. Uh, the YMCA does sponsor a nursing home, which is just outside uh, or just near the YMCA. And um, Japan is facing a pretty large problem with their because they have a large aging population. And this is um, some of the effort that the YMCA has put into it. So our participants will go to the uh, nursing home. They'll spend some time with the residents and do a tour. And then they'll take part in a festival called Nagashi Somen, uh, which means flowing noodle. And it's a a festival where um, they get to make these like bamboo shoots that you put noodles down. It may sound kind of odd right now, but it's been really fun for the group and the residents as well. Food is a very big highlight on ICEP Japan. Um, and part of this is because our um, hosts give a lot of freedom to our group to choose what types of things they would like to eat. Um, typically, breakfast will be eat at, eaten at your housing and prepared by you. So you'll go grocery shopping and make some really simple breakfasts. And then for lunch and dinner, most of it is eaten out at restaurants. So um, some choices that you have is going to sushi, get sushi or ramen. Um, Utsunomiya happens to be the um, gyoza capital of Japan. So there's a lot of dumpling options, um, but it's definitely good also to branch out of things that we have in the US as well, um, trying fermented soybeans or sea urchin or something like that. So it is there is a lot of seafood, I gotta say that, um, but usually participants are very excited about the food options. Another nice thing is that there will be some interaction with Japanese teenagers on this program. Um, there's some Japanese high school students that visit uh, the YMCA to interact with our groups. Um, it's really important on all of these programs um, to be you know, sure that you're reaching outside of your group, you know, like a big group of American teenagers can kind of be intimidating um, to some of the teenagers that are coming to visit with you. So making sure that you're trying to break through that shyness and just um, reach out and get to know um, the people that come to interact with our group. Uh, when we ask participants uh, who get back from ISEP Japan what their favorite cultural activity is, um, they say that everything they did in Japan was a cultural activity, from getting on the bus to learning how to order food. Um, and really, that is because the culture is so different than the U.S. So that's a really fun thing to engage in. Um, we do have some more formal cultural learning opportunities on this program, including the cooking class that you see right here, where they're learning how to make gyoza. Um, they'll also go to a tea ceremony and get to visit some pagodas and things like that. Um, another service opportunity um, that you'll have is working with a camp. So you will join up with some um, Japanese teenagers who are bilingual, which is wonderful. And um, you'll get a group of kids who you will get to help facilitate activities with and just get to play with them. Sometimes the group will go on field trips, either to a zoo or a museum. Um, and usually this camp lasts between four or five days. So it's a really great leadership opportunity opportunity for our participants. They're typically extremely tired at the end of it. Um, and if you haven't already gotten the sense already, this program definitely, in terms of service, skews much more heavily towards social service. There are a few um, 
physical service projects. I think a trail maintenance um, one and like a river cleanup, but the majority of it is uh, social service. And then as I mentioned, ISEP Japan um, does have a true homestay. It's between four and five nights long. Um, most participants will be placed in a single homestay as Japanese homes are pretty tiny. Um, and the leaders will work with participants to teach them about um, politeness and just cultural norms, cultural do's and don'ts before going to the homestay because there are quite a few of those um, in Japan. So things like making to take your shoes off before you enter any bathroom room or any building and then um, wearing bathroom slippers is a big thing um, so you don't have to worry about that now but of course if you want to do your own research you're more than welcome but the families have been extremely warm and welcoming with our participants and then last but not least, um, the group will do an excursion to Tokyo where you'll spend one to two nights in the city. And Tokyo is a massive city. So the group is really gonna be choosing, you know, one or two um, neighborhoods to visit. And you'll get a lot of say working with your trip leaders to decide where exactly you wanna go. Um, but this is always a nice excursion for the group. Great, so next up, we're gonna talk about the ICEP China program. We've been partnering with the National Committee of YMCA's in China since the late 1980s, and it's our host partner and country who sets the itinerary for us every year. And so she looks at our program goals and then matches them with the program goals of YMCA's throughout the country. So for this year's program, the group is gonna spend about 10 days in um, starting in Shanghai, and then another 10 days in Nanjing, and then end the program in Chengdu. And so Chinese cities are pretty chaotic and a lot of fun. Um, there's just a lot of people everywhere. There's a lot to see, there's a lot to smell, there's a lot to take in. Um, and so um, similar to what Alyssa was saying before with Japan, just walking around on city streets is just an incredible cultural experience. And we just want to encourage you to make sure you're paying attention to your surroundings and you're helping one another out, especially if you're trying to cross the street as a group all together. So in each of the cities you'll be visiting, um, your group will have anywhere from one to four hosts who are from the local YMCA. And they serve a really important role for the group throughout the program. They're there to um, just help you get acquainted with the city, to help order food at restaurants, um, translate things for you, and certainly answer the many questions that I hope you bring with you on the program. And so within China, each of the cities you'll be visiting is unique. Um, so Shanghai is a very modern city. Nanjing is an interesting blend of the ancient and modern. And then Chengdu, because it's in Western China, um, it's also an older city. It will have probably a very different feel to it and certainly a very different food from the other two cities that you'll be visiting. Throughout the program, um, you can expect very hot and humid weather everywhere you go. And it is likely that you'll experience pollution um, throughout the program, but it really just kind of depends on what the weather is like before your group gets there. If you have any concerns about the pollution, we encourage you to speak with your doctor about that. And on this trip, it's um, actually incredibly difficult to find laundry services in China. And so typically, participants will actually wash your clothes by hand in the hotels that you'll be staying in. Uh, so with that in mind, I encourage everyone to bring some extra pairs of underwear and lots of quick drying shirts and shorts. So food in China really varies from region to region. So in each city, um, hopefully you'll notice slightly different dishes and flavors and levels of spiciness or sweetness. Um, and as you can see from the picture, there's always going to be a large uh, variety of options to choose from. And so it's our hosts who are from that city who will typically order the food for the group. And it's customary to always order way too much food, um, which is great because that means you get to try lots of different things. So often, like you see in this picture, the food is served on a Lazy Susan. And then you'll just slowly spin the Lazy Susan and you use your chopsticks to pick up pieces of whatever dish you're interested in trying. 
And so um, we have accommodated vegetarians and or picky eaters on this program before, but again, please make sure you let us know if you're a vegetarian before the program starts so we can let our hosts know. Um, and we really encourage you to, uh, to try different things, even if it looks a little bit different, even if it smells a little bit different, even if the food is looking back at you, um, take the time to just try even a little piece of different things because uh, I think you, you might be pleasantly surprised. There's lots of really great food. Uh, aside from the food, another one of the best parts of the program is going to be all the people that you get to meet. So service on ICEP China is exclusively social, and that's just a, a cultural thing. Um, it's not customary for guests to come to a country and then perform any kind of like physical work or physical labor. So all of the service work you'll be doing is with other people. And that can range anywhere from working with really young children all the way up through working with the elderly, like you see in this picture. And so uh, for this program, um, Service might look a little bit different from what you typically think of as service. Um, it's really uh, a great way just to connect with other people, even if there is a language barrier. And so what's helpful for this program is to just be prepared to share of yourself. Um, during your group's orientation at camp, I encourage all of you to practice singing songs together or doing a dance together because often throughout the program, you will be asked when you visit different places to perform in some way. Um, and so it may seem a little bit silly, but it really is an excellent way to um, create a bond with people even if you don't share the same language. And so at first it might be really tricky walking into a classroom full of children who may or may not speak English, but I assure you by the end of this program, you will be professionals and will know exactly what to do um, and what games to run and how to have fun with those kids. Um, so throughout the program in each of the cities you'll be visiting, you'll have the chance to work with young people um, to help teach them basic English lessons or introduce um, different aspects of American culture or even potentially uh, in Nanjing to take some time to have uh, to work with your Chinese students and have them perform a play in English. Throughout this program, there is a ton of time where you get to interact with uh, groups of Chinese teens and other volunteers through the YMCA. And so uh, we recently learned that this program likely will not have homestays this year. Um, we'll know for sure when we get uh, the itinerary update from our host partners in May. Uh, but at this point, we'll say it's safe to assume there will not be homestays. Uh, but don't worry because you will have, like I said, tons of time to work with Chinese teens and to learn more about the culture through them. Because in each of the cities that you'll be visiting, you'll often get paired up with a group of either Y volunteers or Chinese teens. And those teens and volunteers are with you um, throughout most of your time in that city. So they go with you on service projects. Sometimes you spend entire days um, just doing icebreaker games with them and different team building initiatives. And so it's a really wonderful opportunity to just learn more about what life is like in China as a teenager. With that, sometimes the teens can be incredibly shy. And often I think that's just because um, we're asking them typically to speak in English, which might be their second or third language. And sometimes people feel like their English skills are not very good. So this is where even if you just learn how to say hello in Mandarin, um, that can go a long way towards breaking the ice and encouraging the, the Chinese teens to open up and, and practice their English with you. Oh, also connected to that, it is really helpful to, to bring, like Alyssa was saying, either like postcards or bookmarks or just small trinkets from home because in each of the cities before you leave, there's often a farewell party. Um, where the teens will often write really sweet messages to you and then pass that off to you before you go. So it's helpful to have something ready to reciprocate. Um, the group will also get to take part in a lot of different types of cultural activities. So you might learn some of the basics of calligraphy like you see here. You might get the chance to uh, make some jiaozi, which is uh, the Chinese form of dumplings. 
um, or go out for karaoke or learn some Kung Fu as a group. And so again, these cultural activities you get to often do with the Y volunteers. And so it's just another nice opportunity to both learn more about the culture, but then get to know some of the local teens as well. To see another more restful side of Chinese culture, I highly encourage your group to try to visit a public park, especially if you can get there on a weekend morning. Um, it's a really nice change from a lot of the hustle and bustle that you'll experience in the cities there, uh, because often, especially on weekend mornings, uh, you can see older people will go to parks to sing together or play traditional instruments. Uh, families with young children will go to fly their kites. Uh, older people will do Tai Chi or line dancing, which you can kind of see in the background in this picture, um, or they'll sit together uh, in the shade with their birds. And so really visiting the parks is just a really fun way to learn more about the culture and also um, to get in some great people watching. Your group will have about one day in each of the cities that you visit to uh, that's unstructured, where as a group you can decide together what you'd like to do for the day. And so it's a great way to just uh, often visit a particular part of the city that you haven't seen yet. So for instance, lots of groups will take that time to visit a market uh, to get the chance to practice uh, your haggling skills and see if you can get some fun souvenirs for a good price. Um, or you might visit an art district or a museum or just another famous area of the city. Um, the group here is pictured close to the Pearl Tower. Uh, it's kind of in the background from them um, across the river from the Bund. And China has such a rich, vast history that we also want to make sure you get to visit some of the important historical sites each city has. So throughout the program, you might take some time to visit Taoist or Confucian temples. You may get the chance to visit a Buddhist monastery or older parts of the cities, um, including ancient city walls. Um, and in Chengdu, we're hoping you're going to get the chance to visit a giant panda museum and just see other interesting aspects of each city. All right, so now we are on to ICEP Vietnam. Um, so everything about this section of the slideshow re relates to both of the Vietnam programs. They really do have pretty much the same itinerary. It's just staggered a little bit by dates. So our uh, program host is located in Ho Chi Minh City, which is way in the south of Vietnam. Um, but this, this program travels a lot. So you will see um, a, many different parts in southern Vietnam. Um, you'll make your way um, north, stopping at a few cities along the way. And you're actually going to end your program all the way in the northern Vietnam in Hanoi before flying home. So lots of travel time on this program. Uh, so this is a picture of Ho Chi Minh City, which, as I mentioned, this is where our host is located. It's a very busy, uh, vibrant city. There's a ton of motorbikes there. Um, and you're going to spend, this is where you will fly into, and you're going to spend about four days here. Um, and while you're here, you're going to get an orientation to Vietnamese culture, which is going to include um, a really basic language lesson and also learning how to cross the street uh, safely. You're also going to get to visit some museums, including the War Remnants, Remnants Museum. Um, and But really, this portion of the program is going to be pretty short because the majority of your program is going to be spent traveling um, outside of the city. Um, so from Ho Chi Minh City, you'll go a little bit further south uh, to the Mekong River Delta, and um, you'll spend about a week here. Um, part of that will be in the city of Can Zhou. Um, there is a, even though there's no true homestay on this program, you will do more of like a tourist experience where you will stay over in what they call like an eco homestay. So it's a little bit more of a rural area, but a really beautiful um, place and get to experience Vietnamese home cooking in just a really beautiful part of Vietnam. Um, also get to visit a mangrove forest and enjoy plenty of seafood while you're here. 
So ICE of Vietnam is actually pretty split down the middle in terms of physical service and social service. And that's because the majority of the service work is in partnership with schools that our hosts are strongly connected to. Um, so this year, our group will do service for about um, one to one and a half weeks each um, in both Ban Tre, which is in the south of Vietnam, and Tui Hoa, which is about central Vietnam. And um, for about half the day, you'll spend it in classrooms um, where you will be visiting with kids, playing games with them, and teaching some informal English lessons. Um, and it's really important to note that because you're here for such a short time, the goal is not to teach English. It's really just to practice words and have fun with the kids. Um, so definitely bring a lot of your camp games and songs with you. Um, there will be some little materials like these flashcards that you see here to help you interact with the kids. But this has been a real highlight of the program. And then while you're at the schools, the other half of it is going to be doing physical service projects. So we donate funds, um, world service funds, which is what we collect during chapel, to our Vietnamese partners to donate to the schools to help um, these projects. And they are pretty physical projects. So expect to get a little bit dirty and also to work hard. Um, Past projects have include building a cement walkway, painting a mural, um, laying down cement for a patio. Um, so it, it's great work and the schools really appreciate it, but definitely bring an outfit that you're okay getting dirty in. Um, and one highlight is at the end of it, um, often the um, either in, like staff from the school or some local people will come down and give um, me cook meals for the participants, which is a really nice um, just time to like build relationships with local community members. There are also uh, many excursions on uh, ISEP Vietnam, which are not related to service. Um, one of them is, this is a picture of Hoi An, which is a really beautiful city um, in central Vietnam. It's a world UNESCO heritage site. Um, you'll also get to do a lot of hiking, a lot of uh, visiting pagodas and going to beaches throughout your time there. Uh, about a third of the way through the program, uh, once from central Vietnam, you are going to get on a train and it's an overnight train um, to head up to Hanoi. So this is just inside of the train. It's a sleeper train. And once you arrive there in Hanoi, you'll spend a few days in the city, just getting to explore the city. It's a really beautiful um, area with a lot of French architecture and delicious food that's a little bit different from the food you can expect in southern Vietnam. Um, some things you could do is go to a water puppet show. There's a bunch of museums that you can visit there. And it's just nice to have some casual time just to walk around the city. And one quick excursion you'll do from Hanoi is going up to visit Ha Long Bay, which is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, it's a bay that has these very large limestone islands that come out of the ocean. So you'll do a short boat tour um, of this area and then do one night up into the up in the city that's right right there. And so we've talked a bit about food for the other programs. Um, for ISEP Vietnam, the majority of your food will be eaten at restaurants. And there is a lot of variety, um, similar to what we mentioned for both of the other programs. Um, lots of fruits and vegetables, rice and seafood are also very common. Um, typically, our program host orders all of the um, plates for us. So there's a lot of variety for you to choose from. And um, she, I know our program host is particularly sensitive about food waste. Um, so it's really important just to be communicating with your trip leaders and to the host the things that you as a group really like, things that you didn't like so much so that she gets used to how to order for your group. Um, and, but of course, you know, it's really important to try new things. And if you don't like something, that's okay, but make sure that you're getting enough to eat. And as I mentioned, there's no true homestay on Vietnam, but our program hosts do set up family visits. So you'll get to meet during the daytime with a family um, that's connected to our program hosts. Um, and usually it's just, it's during the daytime. So you might just go to their home. You might meet at a restaurant or get to do, sometimes our kids will do like a little cooking class with them. So it's just a fun cultural experience. And again, a great place for you to just bring a little gift or a card just to show that you're grateful. 
Great, so now we're gonna head into the final portion of our presentation where we'll be focusing on logistics that pertain to all four of the programs. Um, so the first thing we'll be talking about is luggage. Uh, the type of luggage you bring really just comes down to personal preference. It's fine to bring a large backpacking backpack if you're used to that. I would say most of our campers bring large rolling suitcases, um, and so that bag gets checked. You just want to make sure that first you can carry all of your belongings yourself, uh, second that you keep that bag to under 50 pounds, and uh, last but not least, make sure that you're leaving room for any souvenirs that you might pick up for others on your program. In addition to the checked bag, we encourage everyone to bring a small bag, like a school backpack, um, as your carry-on item. And that's really helpful on the program itself whenever you have a day trip where you just want um, some snacks and your water or spare supplies with you. When it comes to packing, please make sure you're following the packing list closely. Um, you want to make sure you're bringing clothes that you're comfortable re-wearing um, and that are comfortable for really hot, humid weather. Uh, often on these programs, laundry is only done maybe two or three times. It does vary a little bit from program to program. Um, like I said before, on the China program, you're often doing your laundry by hand. On um, the Vietnam program, it's every once in a while throughout the, the trip. And with Japan, again, it can be done occasionally at the Y and then also in your home stay. Um, but again, just be ready for that hot, humid weather that you'll experience on the program. We also encourage you to bring a spare small bag with you to camp so that if you have any items you realize you don't want to bring with you overseas, you can put those items into that bag and then we'll store it for you here at camp. It's also helpful to just leave behind a clean pair of clothes so that when you get back from the program, you've got something nice and ready for you to change into. And if you play any musical instruments that you can uh, easily travel with, including uh, guitars or ukuleles, uh, we're happy to check a guitar for your group if you are a musician, um, or if you just have other small activities or, or games that your group can enjoy during some downtime that's also really helpful to bring along. Great. So we've already talked a lot about food um, on all of these programs, um, but just a couple more details to share is that for all of these programs, we can accommodate a pretty wide variety of food allergies and dietary restrictions. We just need to know about it ahead of time so we can communicate it with our hosts. Um, so it's really important that you're putting that information into the BCC YMCA health forum. Um, that's the place that we look for those sorts of things just to make sure that our hosts are prepared prepared to host you. Um, if you do have any specific concerns about food or food, food allergies, um, definitely feel free to reach out to either Becky or myself and we can help you um, with that. Food sanitation and water safety is a very um, important topic for all of these programs and our um, trip leaders will give participants an orientation to how that works on the program. Um, you know, there's it's a little bit different depending on the location, but the important thing to know is that you will have um, filtered or bottled water provided for you throughout the entire program and you're going to be prepped, um, you know, about what fruits and vegetables are okay to eat. Um, versus what's not, you know, it's a pretty good idea to avoid street food and things like that. So, um, you know, it's not something you have to worry about too much now, but just know that you'll get an orientation at camp and it's something just to be mindful heading into your program. Um, and then I think Becky said it earlier, just, um, you know, you're going to be having, be exposed to a lot of new foods and new flavors and new smells that you've never experienced before. And um, it's really important that you're trying new things because that's a big part of these trips is it's a cultural experience to have the food from another country. Um, it also just shows a lot of gratitude and graciousness. So um, try it. If you don't like it, that's okay, but um, always try it because, again, you might be pleasantly surprised. The group is together for most of the program, but there are times when participants are not directly supervised by their trip leaders. And so that can happen while they're in their home stays or on a home visit 
or if the trip leaders give the group some free time. And that's typically if the group is in an area they want to explore a little bit more, um, like a market, for instance. And so before free time is given, the trip leaders will always review a set of guidelines with you. And those include that all of the participants always need to be in groups of four or more during the free time. And the idea behind that is that if one person were to get injured somehow, the second camper could stay with the first person and the other two campers could go get help. Um, the leaders will also set boundaries that the, the group needs to stay within. So for instance, if you were exploring a city market, the leaders might say that you need to stay within two city blocks. Um, or if you're in an airport, they might say you need to stay within that particular wing of the airport. And then they'll always give a check-in time and meeting location where the group needs to meet back up. As I mentioned before, too, participants should always have those ID cards on you um, that will have phone numbers for being able to get in touch with us or the partners in country or a cell phone that your trip leaders will have. Great. So by now you should all have received uh, the bios for your trip leaders. So we have made those announcements to all programs. I want to just talk a little bit in general about the leadership uh, qualifications that we have for our uh, trip leaders. So all of our leaders are at least 21 years old or older, um, and they're all certified in wilderness first aid and CPR. And then um, between 90 and 95% um, typically, although this year it's 100%, um, actually come from within our organization. So that means they've either worked as counselors at the camps or they've been on program staff. Um, we also get a lot of trip leaders who come over from Berkshire Outdoor Center and day camp. And really what this results in is that our staff, uh, they just really understand and feel connected to our community, uh, which is very important to us because these programs are not just travel programs, they're really extensions of camp and we want um, our participants to feel that. And then in terms of qualifications, we look for leaders who have, of course, experience working with teenagers, um, show good judgment skills, and have experience leading off-site programs um, because it's very different from the on-camp experience. And I'd say from our perspective as administrators that working with our trip leaders is definitely one of the highlights of our job. They're a really wonderful group of people who are just really amazing mentors uh, for our participants. So it's always a great thing. Participants are not allowed to bring cell phones or devices that connect to Wi-Fi while you're on the program. And that's because we really want you focused on your group and the experiences that you're having and uh, not be distracted by social media. So even though you won't have your phones, uh, there are ways for you to keep in touch with your family while you're on the program. The easiest way, especially with the time difference, is um, just by using email. So participants, make sure you get your parents' email addresses, and parents, make sure you get your son or daughter's email address before the program starts. Um, throughout the program, it varies a bit uh, from program to program, but the group will have occasional access to computers, whether that's uh, through their trip leaders or just through the YMCA or their home stays. Um, Another option besides email is to create a Skype account. Um, and so if you visit the Skype website, you can create an account and then you can also add money onto your account. And what that means is that then on the program, participants can log into the Skype account and using the computer can call your home phone or a cell phone here in the States or wherever it is that you live. Um, and we found that that's actually much a much more affordable option than getting phone cards and the like. So um, for parents, it's important to know that our trip leaders aren't monitoring who is emailing or Skyping back home or how often. Um, and so we really encourage you to speak with your son or daughter now about how often you'd like to hear from them. Uh, but please try to set realistic expectations. Um, most campers, if they email or call home, they really only do so once or twice, usually throughout the whole program. And for participants, while you're on your program, if you have tried to email but it wasn't working, or you just haven't been able to connect with your parents and you'd like to, definitely let your trip leaders know. Um, they'll work with our partners to make sure that they find a time when you can connect with them. 
Um, for parents, again, even if you're not hearing from your child, uh, you will still be getting updates on them roughly every seven to 10 days or so, uh, because the trip leaders will write up um, just telling us more information about where the group is in their itinerary and what they've been up to. And they'll email that to us and then we'll email it to all of you. So you will still be getting updates, um, even if it's not necessarily coming from your child. And also for parents, if you need to reach your child during the summer, uh, the fastest way to get in touch with them is to call us. So we will carry two on-call cell phones with us 24-7 throughout the summer. And we'll pass that phone number or the phone numbers along to you when you arrive at camp for your group check-in. Um, and so again, you just give us a call on those cell phones and we will help you connect as soon as we are able. And so those phones get rotated um, between myself, Alyssa, and Olivia, our program assistant. Great. So as much planning as we put into these programs, we do understand that unplanned events can happen. And so we want to talk to you a little bit about how we prepare for more major emergencies that could come up on a program. Uh, so first, just in terms of our major resources that we're looking to, um, starting with the, well, the State Department, the Center for Disease Control, and then our peer organizations are big ones on our list. So the State Department um, issues travel warnings and advisories, um, and we do monitor those on all of our programs um, throughout the year, but especially during the summertime. And the Center for Disease Control is really the best place that we um, have in terms of looking for health information. So we really do encourage you um, to go to those pages. Uh, State Department has a page for each of every country, so you can look at their um, travel advice. One thing um, to note is that it's really important when you're looking at the warnings and advisories um, that you're comparing it to the itinerary that our group is going to be traveling on. So that's really what we are doing on our end. Just as an example, you could have a warning for the U.S., but it's, you know, something that happened in Florida and our group is in Massachusetts. So it's really that uh, level of detail that is important. Um, but of course, it's good to educate yourself. Um, and then we are looking to our peer or organizations for support, and then a major resource that we have, um, which is really structurally different from a lot of other travel programs, is our in-country hosts. So as we've mentioned, all of these um, programs we're working with, um, you know, BCCYMCA is hosted by um, an in-country partner or who is affiliated with the YMCA, and they're really the ones that have the on-the-ground knowledge um, and really just a lot of good community contacts. So we would certainly rely heavily on them in the case that um, something more major came up on the program just to be a resource for us. We do enroll all participants in the STEP program, um, which is called the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program. That's a program through the State Department where essentially we enroll our groups. Um, we let them know who is in the group and where we're going to be um, throughout the month that we're traveling. And in that case, if there were something to come up, um, the State Department would be aware of you know, where our group is and who the emergency contact is on that. We also do purchase evacuation insurance for our group. Um, typically, that will be purchased in May, and we'll send you out a copy of the policy. Um, however, the important thing to note on this is that if for some reason we needed to bring a group out of a country, the expense would not fall to families. So that's something that Becca Timmy Corners would cover. And then last, um, I put up here when to cancel or when to evacuate. And really, I put this up here because often the issues that come up on program that would fall into the more major category are not necessarily black or white decisions. And by that, I mean that they're not always just easy you know, bring the group out of the country. You know, for example, if you had an earthquake that was in the city that our group was, odds are we would just bring the group home and that's a pretty easy decision to make. Typically the things are much more gray and just require um, a lot more decision making um, to come to a conclusion about whether or not it's safe for them to be there. And um, I let families know that because, you know, throughout that process of making that decision, we really do involve families in that because you know you, you know you might be worried, of course, about um, participants being there. So we will reach out, we will communicate um, early and often, and really involve you in making that decision.
We want our programs to be positive, growth-filled experiences for all of our participants. So with that in mind, we like to be really clear with everyone about our behavior expectations. One of our most important sets of rules are our five non-negotiables. And um, these are really serious rules because if one of them is broken, it means an immediate send home from the program. And it also means that you must wait a year before you're allowed to return to camp. So we review these five non-negotiables uh, with all of the programs while they're here for their orientation before they head out on the program. But we also like to cover them uh, this evening with parents as well. So the five non-negotiable rules are there is no drinking alcohol, there is no smoking of any substance in any form, including e-cigarettes or vaping, um, there is no other illegal activity. Um, so with that, uh, one year on a program, we had a camper who was caught shoplifting. Um, and so that camper was sent home from the program. Uh, fourth is no sexual activity. And last is no breaking of our supervision rules. And by that, we just mean um, you should never be intentionally sneaking out or sneaking away from the group. Um, throughout the program, really, even if your leaders are not right there with you, they should always have a rough idea of where you are. And certainly at night when they're putting you to bed, um, you should be staying in the place that they expect you to be sleeping. So we have sent campers home for reasons other than these five non-negotiables. And we want to be fair, but we also understand that, especially on 36 day long programs, even a small behavioral problem can really start to bring the whole group down um, or hurt our relationship with our host partners um, and just exhaust our trip leaders. And so if there is some type of behavioral issue, often we follow a three step process. Uh, where first your trip leaders will pull you to the side and um, explain to you what it was that they saw that needs to be changed. Um, if the behavior were to continue, that's when we would reach out to parents and we would involve you in that conversation with your child. And then if the behavior were to still continue, that's when we would begin the process of sending someone home. So we place a strong emphasis on risk management for all of our programs. However, accidents, injuries, and illnesses can occur. And we want to talk to you just about how we manage those on our travel programs. So as I mentioned, all of our leaders are trained in wilderness first aid and CPR, but and they do carry a first aid kit while they're over there, um, but they are not trained medical professionals. And that's really where these programs differ from the on-camp experience, where we have a full medical team at the service of campers and staff. And because of this, we tend to be a lot more conservative when it comes to managing camper health on the programs. So if we have a participant that, you know, is just not feeling well for a few days, maybe it's some kind of stomach thing that just seems to be lasting a little too long, we're much more likely to just bring them to a clinic just to get checked out and make sure that they are all right. And um, any time on a program, when we take a participant to higher level medical care, we will always reach out to parents um, to let you know what's going on. And so typically our trip leaders who carry cell phones on the programs will reach out to us and we'll reach out to you to make sure that we can get you on the right phone number. And then we will help you connect um, to your participant in country just so that you can hear their voice and also um, ask any questions that you might have at that time. Time. Any kind of expenses that come up on the program that are medical related, our trip leaders will just cover so participants don't have to use their spending money on that. And then additional, in addition to evacuation insurance, we also buy uh, travelers health insurance for all participants. Um, so we'll send you a copy of that policy again um, in May, probably late May, so you can review it. Um, and then last, um, it should be known already, um, but just in case not, participants are responsible for carrying their own medications on these programs as well as administering their medications. Um, so if you are not comfortable uh, taking your medication regularly at this point, it's a good thing to start uh, practicing at home so that you'll feel really comfortable once you get on the program. 
Your program tuition covers all expenses like food and snacks, transportation, bottled water, and certainly all the activities on the program. But most participants like to bring some personal spending money just for their own snacks and for gifts for people back at home. And so if you do decide to bring spending money, we encourage you to bring no more than $300. And we often suggest bringing it in two different forms just because you'll be carrying it yourself. So uh, we recommend about $60 or so in cash. And uh, we encourage you to bring cash that's crisp new bills because when you get in country, often banks will only um, exchange dollar bills that are, are new and they won't exchange any bills that are, are have any rips or tears or just kind of crinkled. In addition to the $60, then we suggest bringing about $240 on a debit card. And so for participants, if you are bringing a debit card, you want to make sure that you know the PIN for the card um, and definitely tell the bank that you'll be using it abroad before you get to camp. Um, and then on the program, you will be responsible, like I mentioned before, for carrying your own money um, and that debit card. Um, in the past, we've had parents try to purchase gift cards that claim to work overseas, but we have never been able to get those gift cards to work. So please avoid those. Um, on our programs, the trip leaders will be carrying camp issued credit cards. And if for some reason someone's debit card isn't working, um, our trip leaders can issue funds for the campers. But before we do that, we always reach out to parents first and get your permission as well as a specified amount that you would like us to give to your son or daughter. And then at the end of the summer, the trip leaders uh, will keep track of that and any ATM or credit card fees associated with the transaction and they'll send you a bill for it then. Great. And we have booked the flights for all of these programs. Um, and I'm just going to go through so you're aware of what airlines the group is flying on, but the actual itinerary will come to you in May. So you will get that, but just a little bit later. So um, ISEP Japan is flying with United. ISEP China is flying with Air China. And then both Vietnam programs are with Cafe Pacific. And um, we get a lot of questions about frequent flyer miles. So you can sign up for a frequent flyer mile program. And once you get your number, please send that to me and I'll pass it on to our travel agent. However, um, for some reason, and it's a little annoying, but Cathay Pacific does not issue um, flyer miles to uh, group tickets, which is what our, ours are. So um, don't go through the headache of setting up an account if you're on Vietnam or Vietnam 2, um, but Japan and China, you are welcome to send that information to me. Um, and then outside of flights, in terms of transportation, we work with a local bus company called Dufour, which will transport our participants from camp to the airport and back again once their program is over. And then while you're in country, um, a lot of the transportation um, for Vietnam, they do hire, it's a, a private bus that will be um, taking the group around and then a lot of walking really while you're there. And for the other programs, there is um, some ground transportation while you're in some of the cities. So it's possible you could take a subway. For Japan, there's a lot of buses that are taken or some trains when you're in Tokyo. Um, so that's really kind of how that works for the programs. All of our groups always spend a couple of days together at camp before and after your program for your orientation and your debrief. And so uh, please check your parent guide for your specific check-in date and time. Um, unlike the check-in process for being in camp with TSP, we have set dates and times for each of the programs. Um, and so all of our check-ins and check-outs will take place at the Chimney Corners Sign Barn, which is across the street from the administration building. Um, when it comes to your check-in, we will give a very brief presentation covering some of the topics that we talked about tonight. And then uh, families, you will say your goodbyes and participants, you will go with your trip leaders to start that orientation process. Um, during your few days at camp, you'll definitely do a lot of icebreakers and team building games just so that you get to know one another a lot better. Uh, you might write a group contract. 
and just talk about uh, cultural norms on your program. And you'll definitely begin talking about uh, leadership on the program and what that might look like. Then um, after your program, when you come back to camp, you'll have your debrief for a couple of days or so, and you'll wrap up some of your leadership paperwork with your trip leaders. And then you'll also work together to put a slideshow together for your families that you will present at the group checkout. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for hanging in there with us. Uh, we're now going to open it up to any questions that you have. So if you find the chat box over on the right hand side of your screen, you can just send us a little question. We'll give it a couple minutes for questions to come in and then um, we'll just answer them in order that they appear. And just to start, I think this was a question that came in earlier in the presentation about whether or not phones are allowed on the program. So we did cover no uh, phones are not allowed on the program. And just to elaborate a little bit on that, we do get a lot of questions about other um, electronics. So really, you can't have anything that accesses Wi-Fi, um, you know, so a lot of People will say, well, you know, nowadays your phone is also your camera, um, is also your music player. Um, so really, we can't have that. You will need to bring a separate camera. Um, and you can bring a separate music player just as long as it doesn't connect to the Internet. Um, and then Kindles are OK. Um, we know that those do um, connect to the Internet, but it's not really great Internet access. So we're OK with that. Um, oh, yeah. So the next question we do have one um, is about bathing and toiletries and um, laundry detergent. Great. I forgot to mention that. Thank right. you. Um, so on uh, on all these programs, the group will be staying um, either at the Y or in hotels and hostels where um, it's similar to a hotel in the U.S. where your room will have a bathroom attached to it. Um, where you can shower or take a bath and, and use um, use the restroom. Um, and your trip leaders will buy laundry detergent for the group. And they um, can also help coach you on how to do laundry by hand, if that's the case. And, and just remind everybody, um, provide the motivation to get the group laundry done. Mm -hmm. um, a question about any suggestions for camera ideas. Yeah, so really any kind of uh, point and shoot camera works great. There's lots of really affordable digital cameras out there that um, work really well. The group will also have uh, their own group camera. Um, so if you don't want to worry about bringing one, you don't need to. Um, but uh, definitely point and shoot is a good way to go, I think. Yeah. Um, we had a question about whether or not there's any um, flights within China during the trip. So th this our so our hosts coordinate any kind of transportation that happens in country. And so typically to get from city to city, the group will either take a flight or a train. And so I know they're still looking at those options uh, right now. But once we know and we'll we'll get the itinerary, you'll get that information at that point. I believe it comes in the itinerary, actually. Um, will campers be required to take a swim test while at camp? So typically our standard procedure has been yes, um, but we've actually been shifting our tune a little bit because not all of the programs do have swimming on them. So if there's no swimming on your program, we actually are not going to put the group through a swim test. Um, but that's kind of still to be determined which programs we're just going to officially block out as having swimming because as we mentioned all of these programs are in very hot humid climate um, so we don't want to set you up to not be able to swim if there's a good opportunity so it's safe to assume that yes you will yes. have a swim test and then be pleasantly surprised if you don't great um, we had a question about vaccinations for Vietnam, and I'm glad this came up. So um, this is a challenging question for us because we we can't give any specific 
recommendations about which vaccinations to get because that really is the decision of a healthcare provider as well as uh, parents. But the resources that you need are first in your parent guide or program guide. There's a section in there that's all about health and there's a little mini itinerary in there, which is a great thing for you to bring um, to your physician, your primary care physician, as well as the big recommendation we have is to visit a travel doctor because they're the ones that specialize in travel health. They can look at that itinerary and really make those recommendations. So, um, yeah, sorry, we cannot be more specific on that, but it really is a healthcare provider question. Is there a good way if parents would like to connect slash introduce ourselves within the group? You know, I, I love that question. We don't have a formal process in place, but I will say that, um, so during our orientations, that's where um, parents and participants will come up to camp. And as Becky mentioned, we'll have a quick orientation. That whole thing lasts about an hour. And there is some a little bit of social time in there. And I do know groups in the past have set up like text mm -hmm. chains and things like that. So um, it's up to you. If, if that's something that you'd like to do, but we don't have like a formal process in place. Uh, do they need detergent in China? Yeah, so again, on all these programs, um, laundry detergent is readily available and the trip leaders will buy that and supply it for the group. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding homestay gift for Vietnam, what quantity of gifts should participant bring? Um, so I would suggest, I think, as Becky mentioned, either like postcard or some cards are nice, just in case you want to write a handwritten note. And then I would say like one to two small things, um, just because they are going to do that more like touristy experience. But it, um, the hosts there are so wonderful that you might want to give them a little something. And then one other just for um, other the other homestay experience. For ISEP China, will participants get their passports back between now and the travel date? Okay, so the answer is um, we do not plan to send back the passports. We will keep them here until the start of the program. However, if you are planning a trip, it's really important that you reach out to us and let us know um, so that we can plan to get it back to you. So yeah, please be in touch. But one note is that we do apply for all of the visas in late April, early May, and the process can take a couple weeks. weeks. So yeah. you shouldn't plan to be traveling anywhere during the month of May. Early June, we could probably get it back to you. What are the sleeping accommodations in China? Yeah, so again, the group will be staying in hotels throughout their time on the program. and. Um, I know, does the host include that in the itinerary where specifically they're staying? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so um, you'll have the names of the hotels once we get the updated itinerary. Mm -hmm. uh, for Vietnam, is there any fresh water swimming or wading in Vietnam um, that might expose kids to untreated water? So um, they do some wading, but it's in it's on beaches, which are like very quiet like we don't go to beaches shallow where there's beach. yeah and shallow it's we don't go to beaches where there's like big surf and they really aren't going to be doing like any swimming or wading in areas where it's not the only like possibility i'm thinking is they do like a mekong um mm. river boat tour but they're not going to be swimming there but they will be around water groups in the past have also taken part in a catfish catching experience which is generally it's like a shallow muddy pool of water but it's not an open a large open body of water by any means right um question about music devices what you can bring um oh gosh any kind of especially older mp3 players again we just don't want you bringing things that can connect to wi-fi so um older style devices tend to work really well and mm -hmm. I'm not a big techie person. I'm sorry, everyone. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. uh, a question about um, dyslexia and going to Japan and if um, Japanese people would be understanding of this disability. Um, I would imagine yes, although I would love 
just to follow up. So feel free just to reach out to us because we could talk in a little more detail about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ICEP China 2, will participants get their passports back? Uh, yeah. So same question. Please reach out if you're going to be traveling and need your passport back. How are room assignments done? Yeah, so that um, it can vary a little bit from program to program. Typically, either the trip leaders will assign them and it, it changes um, from one location to the next, or that might be a responsibility that the trip leaders ask the leaders of the day to take on, uh, keeping in mind just group dynamics and mixing it up so that people get the chance to meet new people. Great. A uh, packing question, do you recommend carrying a money belt or something like that? Yeah, so I think money belts are really handy to have, especially if it's something that you get comfortable with and are used to carrying on you at all times. I will say we have had participants in the past who didn't wear their money belt and they set it on the ground in a public park and then it was taken. So please, um, if you are using a money belt, make sure that you're wearing it appropriately, whether that's around your waist or around your neck. Um, and your trip leaders, while you're here for orientation, will also talk to you um, just about getting in the routine of keeping your passport in a safe place and making sure that you're putting it back in that safe place uh, time after time. On a lot of these trips, too, when your group checks into hotels, um, you'll often actually be required to check your passport into a safe at the hotel as well. So mm -hmm. that's a great place to keep it. Um, question to repeat the airline for China. So China's flying with Air China. And just for the rest of you, Japan is with United and Vietnam 1 and 2 are with Cathay Pacific. Question about vaccinations for China. Um, so I am going to give a very similar answer for um, all of these programs, actually, that if you it's really important that you're visiting a travel doctor to get very specific recommendations, because I could say for all of these programs, I think, um, you know, a lot of it is a family choice. We're happy for you to reach out to us if you have questions about um, the itinerary and some of the activities, the doctor needs to know a little more information. We are happy to be supportive in that, but um, I think going to visit a travel doctor will answer all those questions. Do participants need to bring adapters for outlets or will those be unnecessary? Yeah, so um, adapters can be helpful. If you check your packing list, it should have examples of the various styles of outlets that um, you could find in your country. You can also just Google that really quickly. Um, and often you often don't need power adapters, but an outlet converter itself can be helpful to have. Mm -hmm. Um, great. And then when will more specific information about China 2 be available? Um, so I think if I understand this question, um, so one thing to note is when we did our initial enrollment mm. process, we um, were expecting to have two China programs and we're actually only running one. So China 2 is the only eyes of China that we're running this year. And then um, come May, you can expect for all of these programs to just receive some more detailed information about your program, um, including the itinerary. We're also going to send out the flight itinerary and health insurance and things like that. How many gifts for China? Yeah, so um, with this one, I would just bring like a small handful of postcards. So maybe like five postcards or if you just have a stationary set that you really like, um, because again, um, in each of those cities, it's going to be um, it, it could potentially be a large group of teens, but you might get to know a couple of them in each city a little bit better. So you might want to write them a personal note. Um, and so it doesn't need to be anything big. In fact, I think it's better to bring just something small, like a postcard that you could write a message and then give to someone. Mm -hmm. um, a question about getting a group list, like a parent contact list um, pre-program in case they want to communicate. So I um, am happy to help with this. If you want to just reach out to us um, to just like send us an email to remind us. And then what we would have to do is just send around an email just to get everyone's permission, which is 
um, kind of a pain, but we just, we don't want to share people's yeah. um, contact information really. But yeah, we could have people opt into it for sure. Mm -hmm. um, same question about dyslexia in China. Yeah, I used to, I feel like mm -hmm. it is a thing. I think it, um, especially with, um, for Japan and China, the written language is so different, but I, I think um, people can be dyslexic. It's just a slightly different form from what we're used to in the U.S. Um, yeah, that's a, an interesting question. I, I'd love to look into it more myself, but I'm pretty sure it is something that people there are familiar with. Yeah, but definitely follow up with us if you want to chat in a little more detail about it. Great. All right. Well, uh, we have come to the end of the questions and I um, just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And we did record this, so we'll be um, posting it on YouTube. We'll send you out a link um, sometime early next week. So if you want to share it with anybody that missed it, or of course, if you want to um, review it yourself and watch it again, we're welcome to do that. Yes. And then, um, yeah, please definitely follow up with us if you do have any further questions between now and the start of the summer. And we're looking forward to seeing you all very, very soon. Yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in this evening. Have a nice night.